everyone. Welcome to this video on an introduction to MSK ultrasound. Um, musculoskeletal ultrasound is definitely one of the more advanced applications for point of care ultrasound. There's just so much detail that's there and it's so bunched together into uh, often um, a really tight and compact space. Um, but the purpose of this video is just to get you guys uh, moving, get started on, on the basic techniques. And it, you'll find that if you're able to recognize certain uh, major structures like bone, um, tendon, joints, uh, fat pads, etc., it makes it a lot easier for you to, to keep on learning. So the main goal of this MSK ultrasound video is just for you to, to learn how to really put your, your probe in the hand and to start scanning how to recognize those, uh, those structures, how to optimize your image. And uh, with that, we're going to focus on the knee the, the elbow and the hand. Um, if you're wondering how is this different from the last video from 2014 on MSK ultrasound, we're not using the shoulder uh, this time. So if you're interested in shoulder ultrasound, watch the older video. I do want to introduce the guest stars of this video. They are members of our ultrasound peer education program, and uh, they've done a fantastic job with narration of some segments of this video. So in order of appearance, we have Jenna Paul Schultz, Karen Bryant, and Danny Lee, all from the class of 2022. So without further ado, let's take it away. All right, we have our twenty-six-year-old female here who came into the emergency room for knee pain. So we first did a musculoskeletal exam on her and found to look for um, active and passive range of motion pain. Um, so if she had pain with just active range of motion, we would think a little bit more about musculoskeletal, like muscle pathologies. Um, she, however, had pain with both active and passive range of motion. So we're thinking more about things that might be going on in the joint space. So we're going to take a look with ultrasound to see if there's any fluid in her joint space now. To do that, we're going to start with our knee flexed about 20 to 30 degrees. We're going to look at two areas, both the suprapatellar area and the infrapatellar area as well. So to start with our ultrasound, we're going to use our linear probe with lots of gel. So we'll always have the indicator dot to the head. So the left side of the screen will be towards the head or towards the hip, and the right side of the screen will be towards the feet. All right. So you want to make sure when you start that your depth and your gain are appropriate to what you're looking at. Yep, you can adjust here. Great. So we're going to start to scan in the sagittal plane with the indicator dot towards her head. And you can see the indicator dot is on the left side of the screen. So everything on the left side of the screen will be towards the head and everything on the right side will be towards the feet. As we scan down, we can see the different layers within the leg. So at the top, we see the skin, followed by the subcutaneous fat, followed by the striations of the muscle, and then the cortex of the bone. And as we fan the probe back and forth, you can see how the bone exhibits some anisotropy. So you can see how it gets more sharp into focus as you are more perpendicular to the bone and then more out of focus and fuzzy as you start to fan across it. A brief recap of anisotropy. So when a sound wave hits an object in a perpendicular fashion, that the echo comes back to the probe and you have a nice clear crisp image. Now if the probe is slightly off axis so that the ultrasound beam hits the surface in a non 90 degree or non perpendicular fashion, that sound wave will actually echo off and most of it will not come back to the probe. And this is why the image on the right is hazy and less distinct than the image on the left. So now we're going to start sliding the probe down the, um, down the thigh towards the knee to get a good view. As we do so, we can see how the quadriceps muscles come together into a big hyperechoic band. Now we'll come and insert right on the top of the patella. In this location, 
directly superior to the knee, we can see the two fat pads. We have the prefemoral fat pad as well as the quadriceps fat pad. The major structures in the superpatellar space to recognize are the quadriceps tendon, which is long fibers that connect to the patella, as well as the patella and the femur itself, which exhibit the same bony appearance of a hyperechoic uh, line with shadowing deep to it. And then you have the fat pads, which are hyperechoic, but more globular in appearance. And you have the quadriceps fat pad just underneath the, the tendon itself, and the femoral fat pad above the, the femur. So in this patient, we can see a small amount of black fluid between the two fat pads. That small amount of fluid is normal. In somebody with an effusion, we would see a lot more fluid in this area. If you're having trouble getting a good view, try to see if you might be off center. If you are too medial or too lateral, it can be hard to find the two different fat pads. So ensure that you are in the midline directly above the kneecap. In this super patellar effusion, you can see the quadriceps tendon and the two fat pads, but there's a large anechoic fluid collection between both of those. So now we're going to take a look at the infrapatellar space. As we do this, we're going to follow the quadriceps tendon up and over the patella as it becomes then the patellar tendon. And we can even watch this come and connect into the tibial tuberosity as well. So here, this space is less sensitive for finding um, effusions in the joint space, but we can tell that if there is fluid above the tendon and we feel kind of bogginess on the kneecap, that's more likely to be something like a prepatellar bursitis. But if we see fluid underneath the tendon between the patella and the tibial tuberosity, that's more likely to be fluid in the joint space that we're concerned about here. In the infrapatellar space, identify the patellar ligament by its long fibers and note that it attaches to the patella and the tibial tuberosity. And then immediately below that ligament is the infrapatellar fat pad. Remember, this space is less sensitive for finding fluid in the joint space than the suprapatellar space. These are long and short axis images of a prepatellar bursitis. On physical exam, you'll feel some bogginess over the patella or the patella ligament. On ultrasound, you'll identify the patella ligament, um, seen as those red arrows right there, and you'll note that the fluid collection is just above uh, the ligament itself. All right, so today we have a patient who presented after falling on her right arm with elbow pain. We did some x-rays which didn't show any obvious fracture, but we want to take a look with the ultrasound because we're still concerned about a possible occult fracture. So we're going to start um, by putting the probe on the posterior upper arm so we can get a view of the triceps muscles here and the humerus here as well. Um, and you can see if we have our depth is too increased, we actually can see an artifact where we see reflection of this muscle underneath the bone or in the bone, which is artifact. So you want to decrease the depth. So you've got a window where you see the subcutaneous tissue, the muscle, and then the bone here. Um, and if you fan the probe, you can see that anisotropy of the bone. It comes out of focus and gets fuzzy goes back into focus in a sharp line when you're perpendicular. So we'll scan inferiorly down towards the elbow with the probe indicator pointing towards her shoulder. And we'll move down so we can see the elbow joint. And you can see the triceps muscle will come together um, into a tendon as we get closer to the joint. So now here we can see um, the triceps muscle coming into a tendon here that's attaching to the olecranon here. And we see here the olecranon fossa with the fat pad here. Um, and here we can see the humerus. And we can see that the fat pad is in line with the humeral um, level as well. So this fat pad doesn't look elevated. And if we were looking for an effusion, we might see fluid here 
um, underneath the fat pad and what that would cause the fat pad to be elevated, which we don't see here. This is a schematic of the structures that you'll find on posterior elbow ultrasound. Deep to the skin and subcutaneous layer, you'll see the triceps and long axis, and it'll be connected to the olecranon process of the ulna. And just deep to that, you'll see the fat pad, which is an asterisk right there. And it lies in that little groove in the, the posterior humerus uh, called the olecranon fossa. And this is a, a really simple way to identify an elbow effusion. Look at how much detail you have on ultrasound. You are able to see the triceps and long axis, all the fibers connected to the olecranon process. And just deep to that is that posterior fat pad. And most of it should lie in the olecranon fossa, and you don't see any fluid that elevates that fat pad. In this elbow effusion, you could still see the olecranon fossa, but now the fat pad has been raised by a pocket of fluid, which is anechoic. And you could see the fat pad on the right side of the screen and a little bit more superficial now. So another thing we can do while we're looking at the elbow is look at the anatomy and see how that changes as we move the elbow. So we can have the patient flex and extend their elbow, and we can look at how the triceps tendon moves. And with the olecran on here, also coming into view with extension and flexion of the elbow, we can see the fat pad coming back into view. And then we, as we extend the elbow again, we see the movement of the triceps muscle and this olecranon comes more into view, which also kind of obscures that fat pad. Um, so you want to make sure that when you're taking x-rays of the elbow, that the X, you get them with flexion so that you get that really nice view of the fat pad. All right, so now we're going to take a look at the same area of the upper arm and elbow in a short axis view. So we put the probe with the indicator pointing um, medially. Um, and we can see here, this is our humerus. We can actually see a view of the radial nerve really nicely here. And then we'll move inferior just like we did um, with the other views. Um, sliding inferiorly, we can see the triceps muscle here, the nerve here. And as we get closer to the elbow, we will see the medial and lateral epicondyles. So it kind of inverts here. We get a short axis view of that olecranon fat pad and the olecranon fossa. And then we can see the lateral and medial um, epicondyles. Medial will be towards the probe indicator. Um, and you can see as well an area, um, an echogenic area, which is likely the triceps tendon. Um, it's a little bit brighter than the surrounding um, triceps muscle, which is a little bit more um, hypoechoic. So we're here at the elbow. You can see the olecranon fossa in the middle of the screen um, with the epicondyles on either side. And so to get this image, you may need to slide the probe from side to side so you can get that fossa right in the middle of your image. Um, so moving from side to side, and then you also may need to tilt or fan the probe in order to get a really nice image of this olecranon fossa. Because um, if you're tilted or fanned in the wrong direction, you might only see a little bit of it. And so if you can adjust, um, you can bring it into a better view with more of the fossa in view and in the middle of the screen with the epicondyles on either side. This was shot in the busy all of you ER. And there is a lot of ambient noise. Um, and yes, that is my stalker breathing in the background, so I apologize for both. Now, this is the posterior elbow ultrasound, and you can recognize the, the cortex of the humerus, the distal humerus, as the blue line right there. You'll note that there are two humps, and in the middle there's a depression or groove. The hump on the left is the medial epicondyle, the hump on the right is the lateral epicondyle, and in the middle is that olecranon fossa. The posterior fat pad sits in the olecranon fossa pretty snugly in its, um, the yellowish structure. And if you draw a line between the epicondyles, that fat pad should be below that line. In this elbow effusion, the posterior fat pad has actually been displaced out of the scan plane so we can't see it. Instead, we see this pocket of fluid that rises above that interconjure line. So this is a, an effusion on ultrasound. And that is a needle actually um, being guided under ultrasound for arthrocentesis. Shake your hands to the left. Shake your... So this is a 26-year-old female presenting with hand pain, swelling, as well as a fever. Um, initial x-ray findings of the hand were clear. So at this point, we want to get a hand ultrasound. Um, as you can see here, we actually have a water bath for um, this hand ultrasound because 
the hand um, has irregular surfaces. Um, it's a bit difficult to um, acquire some of the images, so we use the water as a medium for the um, ultrasound waves to pass through. So we'll start at the level of the wrist. As you can see here, the um, indicator is on the medial side of the patient. That's on the left side of the screen here, um, which corresponds to um, the anatomical um, ulna bone as well as radio bone here. Um, and as we slide um, inferiorly, we'll start to see some of the um, carpal uh, hand bones. Um, there's more echogenicity here. Um, this is actually the uh, scaphoid bone. We start to move more distally. And as we move more distally, we'll start to see some of the uh, metacarpals come into place. So here we see the uh, metacarpals. Um, and above, more superficially, is the uh, flexor tendons. If we, at this point, um, tilt the probe, it will come uh, more into place or out of place. Um, and that's, again, the phenomenon of uh, anisotropy. Um, we want the angle to be um, nice and perpendicular to the flexor tendon. These are short axis or axial cuts of the hand and wrist on MRI uh, from the level of the distal radius and ulna to the carpal bones and to the beginning of the metacarpal bones. Now there's a tremendous amount of complicated anatomy in the hand and you'll see all of that in, on MRI as well as ultrasound but start first by learning what bone looks like as well as the tendons themselves in both short axis and long axis. Here at the level of the metacarpals in short axis you can see the bones outlined in blue with the typical hyperechoic arc and shadowing below. And the tendons are outlined in green on ultrasound and by those arrows on the MRI cross-section you could see the display of anisotropy by fanning or tilting of those tendons and right above is the subcutaneous fat and skin. And as you continue to slide the probe towards the fingertips you'll find the MCP joint, the PIP and DIP joints as well. And this is an example of a hand infection where you have anechoic fluid not only in the tendon sheath, but around the soft tissue above. So now we're in long axis view. Um, we're starting around the metacarpals. And we can see here the flexor tendon. As a patient flexes their finger, we can see the flexor tendon slide. As we move more distally, we'll start to see um, right here is the, the MCP joint. And as we move more distally, we'll see the PIP come into place right here. And even more distally, the DIP right, right, right here. And as patient flexes the finger, we can see the uh, flexor tendons uh, slide back and forth. Earlier, we saw axial cuts of the finger on ultrasound uh, from the flexor side. And on the right side of the screen, you have the same uh, cross-sections from about the MCP to the DIP uh, ultrasound on the right side and then the MRI uh, images on the left. And you'll notice that the detail is pretty similar. But again, just focus on the relationship between the finger bones and the flexor tendon, which is just superficial to it. To obtain the long axis, we rotate the probe 90 degrees, and now you see the flexor tendon with the fibers in long axis in green right there. And you see the two bones, the metacarpal in blue and the proximal phalanx in yellow, and that makes it the MCP joint. Now, as Danny mentioned, you can now slide the probe towards the fingertip, and you can also have the patient flex their fingers to demonstrate the flexor tendon moving back and forth. And so that's MCP. You'll go to the PIP next here, and then at the very end is the, the DIP here. This is one example of some of the pathologies that you can find on ultrasound. This is flexor tendosynovitis, which is due to inflammation or infection of the flexor tendon itself, and you could see fluid in the sheath. To wrap up, remember to use your depth and your gain to optimize your image. Recognize anisotropy, and then you can fan or tilt or even angle to uh, get a better image. Look for the superpatellar space in the knee and look for the two fat pads between the quadriceps tendon and the femur. In the elbow, remember you're doing a posterior elbow ultrasound, you're looking for the olecranon fossa, and you're looking for elevation of the posterior fat pad. And in the hand, we're really looking for the relationship of the bone and the flexor tendon, and any evidence of fluid, 
in the tendon sheath itself or the surrounding soft tissue. Also, if you see something that just doesn't look right, remember that you have the contralateral extremity to compare. And really the most important takeaway in point of care ultrasound is that you need to keep on practicing and do not be afraid to make mistakes because that is the only way that you will get better. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at my Gmail account or look me up in the MedNet directory and visit our website at uclaemultrasound.org. Also, much thanks again to Jenna, Karen, and Danny for their excellent job with narration. Again, they're part of our ultrasound peer education program.